Uh, we zijn uitermate trots dat het ons ook echt gelukt is, met hulp van Pierre Rutgers en zijn collega's, om dokter James Merlino hier te kunnen krijgen. Zoals al gezegd, de Chief Experience Officer, alleen al de naam herbergt al een ongelooflijke verwachting. En dat is wel heel erg mooi om te mogen zien. Uh, Dr. James Merlino is een practical uh, colorectal surgeon at the Digestive Disease Institute. And also is founder and current president of the Association for Patient Experience. And he'll elaborate on that later on. I first learned about Dr. Merlino in a short video that was taped at TEDMED, in which Dr. Merlino, together with another friend of us, e-patient Dave, discussed about the things that they were seeing at that very conference. Uh, I would like to invite, without further ado, Dr. James Molino to the stage. Thank you, Lucian. It's a pleasure to be here. Our, our hospital and our university have a long relationship, and I know that he and several of his colleagues visited us in Cleveland uh, multiple occasions. So I want to pick up on this theme about the patient, because it's interesting when you think about this. Um, it's not just that we are all connected to healthcare, because we work in healthcare, right? Certainly physicians, nurses, people that work for hospitals. But think about this. We are the only industry, we are the only service that touches everybody. So it doesn't matter if you work in healthcare or not. What's really critical to understand is that either today or someday in the future, uh, everybody will be a patient, right? No one cannot be a patient. So we are all connected by this ecosystem where it's not just about what we do for patients, but it's how we really work together. And more importantly than just thinking about how we interface with patients is how we interact with each other. Because we have to work together to deliver high quality, safe healthcare to patients. And we have to make sure that when we come to work every day and do what we're doing, that we take into consideration how we feel. I'm gonna show you a video. We made this for our organization because we wanted everybody that works at the Cleveland Clinic to understand uh, what it means to be on the other side of healthcare. We wanted everybody at the Cleveland Clinic to understand that together we bring things to healthcare that we have to consider so that we understand how it interfaces with patients.
So the purpose of the video is really to demonstrate to everybody in our organization that there's something that goes on with the other side of taking care of patients that we don't often consider. My goal for our organization is to make sure that every person, all 43,000 people that work for us, understand every day what it means to be on the other side. Because I think that you can't deliver compassionate caring, human caring, unless you understand what it's like to be a patient. And it's not only important to understand what it's like to be a patient, but it's important to understand what we're going through. Because there's things that happen in my life, there's things that happen in the lives of my colleagues that impact what we do every day. This was healthcare 100 years ago. Everything that you could do for a patient was in that black bag, but more importantly, a lot of what we did for patients was in the way we talked to patients, the way we touched patients. This is healthcare today. That's my operating room. I'm a surgeon. And there are so many people involved in healthcare that we lose track of what we're doing. You need people. As you heard Lucian say, we're decreasing the amount of beds we have. And when you look at who stays in the hospitals today, they're very sick because there's more care going on at home. It requires teams of people to take care of complicated patients. People are living longer. We're treating more disease. We have better technology. We've lost something that was with us 100 years ago. In our evolution, in our innovation for healthcare, we've forgotten to really think about what it's like to be on the other side. And it's essential. We have to get back to that. When you ask patients uh, what they want, we're very good at doing this, standing at the head of the bed, especially as physicians, telling patients exactly what they need to know. And in fact, in the United States last year, there was a study that asked top leaders of hospitals, what are the most important things for patients? They said new facilities, quiet time, private rooms, give people more control of their food, give them interactive bedside computers, eliminate visiting hours. The problem with this study is they asked us, they asked the leaders, nobody asked the patients. But if you take the time to really understand what patients want, uh, they want something very different. So we did two studies last year at our hospital and we have about 7 million patients. We really wanted to know what patients think. 92% of corporations will tell you they know exactly what their customers want, but only 8%, 8% actually take the time to really listen and to learn from their customers. Our patients said they want more respect. Now, you'll look at me and say, you spent money to figure that out? That's a true or false question right? Do patients want more respect? Of course they do. But it's not really about that. It's about wanting respect from everybody they encounter. Because think about it. You're a patient. You're sitting in a hospital bed alone, maybe with your family. Who do you know that's around you? Nobody. The person that you probably know the most is your doctor, who maybe you've seen a dozen times in your life. They're really not your friend. Everybody's a stranger, and the patients and their families want people to respect them. Not like there's some number, not like there's some person traveling through a system. They want to be treated like an individual. They want better communication. Now, this is also true or false. Who would say that we shouldn't communicate better with patients? But it's not just about communicating back and forth. It's about communicating with each other. So when I walk in at 6 o'clock in the morning and tell the patient what's going on and I leave and the nurse comes in at 8, if the patient asks the nurse, what did Dr. Merlino say, and the nurse doesn't know, the patient believes that we can't deliver high quality because patients are not sophisticated. Patients are not sophisticated. doesn't matter how smart we are, how many degrees that patients have, how many years they've been in school, they don't know healthcare. 
And so they look for things to judge us on based on things that they understand. It's called a proxy measure. So when the patient sees that the doctor and the nurse don't talk to each other, they wonder, how can the hospital deliver high quality? The doctor and nurse can't even talk to each other. They also want us to listen to them, and they don't want us just to listen to them for the little things, like the plan of care. They want us to pay attention every time they're with us. They want us to really listen to what their needs are. They think we blow things off. We do. They want happy people. Now, I see some people smiling, and I always love when I talk to doctors about this because they'll say, see, it's only about making people happy. But that's not what patients are saying. When I walk into a patient's room and I appear rushed or angry, patients look at me and ask two questions in their minds. Did I do something? Did the patient do something to make me angry? Or is there something that I'm not telling them that maybe made me angry? Patients don't want me to smile. They want me to be consistent. That's what this is about. It's a proxy measure for what they think is going on. Because if you're sitting in the bed and you were just diagnosed with cancer a week ago, you're only thinking one thing. Am I going to live? That's all you're thinking about. So when I walk in and I'm rushed, they wonder, did I do something wrong, the patient? When I walk in and I seem anxious, the patient wonders, if there's something going on in their healthcare that's making me anxious. They think about it as it relates to them. They want cleaner rooms. Now this is interesting because if the family visits the patient and the room is cluttered, the family members wonder if it's safe for their loved one to be treated in the hospital. Because they think if the hospital can't even clean the room, how can they treat my loved one? So what we think and what patients think is very different. There's also this. Who wants to be a patient? <laughs> Anybody? You do? We're the number one heart center in the United States. We have the, num we have the best outcomes better than anybody else in the United States. I'll fly anybody there tomorrow on a private jet for free heart surgery. Free. Who wants it? <laughs> Nobody wants to be a patient. There are millions of other things we'd rather do than come to the hospital. So in summary, patients want to know if we've been on the other side. Do we have empathy for what they're going through? And they want us to treat them with respect. Being a patient is stressful. There is incredible anxiety. There is fear and terror. Lots of uncertainty and confusion. And by the way, we make that worse every day when we talk to patients. And if you talk to patients and their family members, what you learn very quickly is it's exactly the same for them. So nobody wants to be a patient, and these are our customers. And everybody looks at me when I talk about patients as customers, and they say patients aren't customers, but they are. These are the people that we deal with every single day, but we don't think about that. And if we're going to be successful, in delivering great care, we have to think about that. So just to give you some idea of who we are, we're an integrated health system, 1,200 beds. We have 11 hospitals, 18 centers where we deliver care, operations across the world, about $6 billion in revenue, 43,000 people. And that's important because when you try and create patient-centeredness, it gets to be very difficult. We've done very well with patient experience. Uh, five years ago... <coughs> We were in the 10th percentile of all hospitals in the United States for patient satisfaction. So we were down here. And today we're in the 92nd percentile. And when you look at how our doctors communicate, we're in the 65th percentile from nearly the 14th percentile. We are in the 96th percentile for how well we communicate around discharge instructions. And it's interesting because I talk about this not to say, oh, look how great we are. I talk about this because when I started this journey, I used to think we couldn't get that high. I used to think there was no way to improve. But the point is, it is possible. You can improve. 
In healthcare, we're very siloed. We have lots of things that we do for patients. Our responsibility, if we're going to be successful, is to connect those silos together. Because when you think about it, there's a lot of things that happen with patients. Registration, when they get diagnosed, how they get discharged, how we educate them. And linking those together is not easy. And when we don't do it well, we cause tremendous problems, not only for patient experience, but we cause failures in safety and we have poor quality. So our challenge is to unwind that continuum. And everything we do around safety and quality and satisfaction and value, we have to drive across the continuum. And it's not just for safety and quality and satisfaction, but it's anything we do in the hospital. Patients journey through systems, and there's lots of things that touch patients. And as we're looking at the processes that we are responsible for every day, we have to ask ourselves, what does the patient see and how does it connect with the thing that's next to them? How do we make sure that the patient's journey is seamless and that the transitions are smooth? And it's not just about the hospital, but it's about before they come to us and after they go home. The world of healthcare today is changing. It used to be based in the hospital. Today it's based in the community. Hospitals are reserved for really sick people who need procedures and are recovering from chronic medical conditions. Our responsibility, our challenge is to think about what goes on before they become our patient, what happens to them while we are taking care of them, and how we take care of them once we get them back to where they started. Managing that 360 is the patient experience. It's not just about happiness. The other thing that's very critical is this. When I first took on this role, I had no idea how to be the chief experience officer, let alone what it meant. So I had a patient keep a journal. And she was 43 years old. She had rectal cancer. She stayed five days in the hospital. And she wrote down everything that happened to her. And what was interesting is she also wrote down the names of everybody that took care of her. So at the end of five days, there were eight doctors. Guess how many nurses? Anybody? 10? 25? 60. 60 different nurses participated in her care, and they just didn't walk in the room and sign the journal because there was a contest. They actually helped take care of her. And so many other people that at the end of her five days, I walked in on the morning rounds, and she said, Dr. Merlino, I forgot to have three people sign the journal. So the point is that it's everybody. It's not just the doctors. It's not just the nurses. Everybody impacts the patient experience. And what's fascinating about this is that I could be the world's greatest surgeon, and I am, just ask me. <laughs> I could be the world's greatest surgeon, but if the person coming in in the middle of the night to draw her blood sticks that patient 10 times and can't get the blood, that's what she will talk about. So it is a team. It doesn't matter if you have RN or MD after your name. We are all the same when it comes to what we do for patients. And it's not just the experience, it's also safety. If my mother is in that bed and the janitor comes into the room and sees that the patient is seizing, having a seizure, I would hope that that janitor is going to run out and call somebody, right? Because you don't need to be a medical professional to see that there's a problem. This is about creating high-functioning, efficient teams of people that work together because we are all responsible for safety. We are all responsible for quality. We are all responsible for the patient experience. In my organization, the way we did this is patients first. When my CEO, Dr. Toby Cosgrove, became the leader of the Cleveland Clinic, the first thing he said is we are going to make putting the patient experience as his top strategic priority for our hospital. When we took over, we were in the 10th percentile, as I said. 
So we're the number four hospital in the United States. You can't be number four in, num in the lowest 10th percentile for experience. My CEO used to go around and tell people, people come to us for high quality, but they don't like us very much. We needed to change that. The next thing we said was that patient experience is not about happiness. At our organization, as I said, it's about safety, high quality, patient satisfaction, and value. Or as I like to say, safety, quality, satisfaction, everything else. Because this is important when you have conversations with people. So when I talk to a doctor and I say, you know, patient experience is important, he or she pushes back on me and says, you want me to smile more? You don't care about my quality? And I say, no, I care about your safety first, and then quality. The other reason this is important is because patients need to understand as we engage them, what we're thinking about. As a surgeon, when I walk into my patient's room the next day after surgery, they have pain, they don't want to get out of bed, and I tell them, you have to get out of bed. And they say, I don't want to. I don't tell them, okay, stay in bed, I'll come back tomorrow. They get out of bed because it impacts their quality. And I tell them that. I tell them, my first responsibility to you is to make sure you don't have a complication. You have to get out of bed. Don't judge me based on whether you're happy. Judge me based on quality. So it's important that we prioritize the thinking for the organization, and it is important that we prioritize the thinking for the hospital, for the patient. Next, you have to execute. So my friend at Harvard always yells at me and says, Jim, strategy is wonderful. But if you can't do it, you're not going to be successful. And the way we think about improving the patient experience in the Cleveland Clinic is to think about those silos and how we can link them together and then look at three things. Number one, process. <coughs> what things can I fix? What things can I implement that are going to impact what we have to deliver? Number two, people. How do I create a culture where everybody is aligned around the patient? And number three, how do we have better conversations with patients so that they're better partners, that they're better activated? So looking at process. So we do this thing in the United States called nurse hourly rounding, where every hour the nurse walks into a patient's room and asks the patient, do you have to go to the bathroom? Do you need anything? Can I move you? Can I move your personal belongings? Do you have pain? But not every hospital does it because nurses don't like to do it. We did a study in 2010 where we mandated it on six nursing units, and then we measured patient experience scores. So when the, the patient says that the nurse always rounded, Every nursing score hit the 90th percentile. That's the yellow dot. When the patient said the nurse didn't round, they didn't. So nurse hourly rounding is a process. It is a best practice. And after we did this study, we mandated it in our hospital. And not only did patient experience scores improve, but pressure ulcers went down falls out of bed went down, medication errors went down. It's a best practice, it's a process, every hospital should do it. When you look at patients, I'm gonna talk about culture last. We need to do more to engage our patients. In the United States, this has gone through several iterations. We used to talk about educating them, we used to talk about engaging them. Uh, then the word was empowering. In 2013, the word is activate. It doesn't matter what you use, we need to create better partnerships because patients can do more to help us. You saw some great examples that Lucian presented about how you take care to the home to have patients help you monitor what's going on. But the other thing we need to think about is how we communicate. Because when you think about satisfaction, when patients come in with an expectation that we don't fulfill, you get this mismatch. And that's what leads to bad experience, bad satisfaction. Our responsibility is to align them. 
We want to lower expectations. We want to talk to patients about what it means to be a patient. Think about this. We spend hours and hours and hours talking to patients and their families about disease. We tell them how we're going to treat it. We tell them what it means. We spend zero time talking to patients about what it means to be a patient. Do you know what to expect when you come into the hospital? Do you know what to expect uh, when you come in for a procedure? What the room is going to look like? Who's going to be there? You know what the procedure is. You know what the procedure is going to do. But did you know that you may have to do a preparation for a procedure? Did you know you're going to have a neighbor in the hospital? Did you know that there's going to be 20 people coming in and out of your room every day checking on you? We don't talk to patients about that. The nurse call button is a great example. So that's the little button on the bedside. And when you ask patients, what does the nurse call button mean? They will tell you that it's a pop-up nurse response system. They think when you hit the button, the nurse should just be there. Now, I don't know how it is here, but in the United States, it's not like that. But it's interesting, and you ask them, well, why do you think that? Because they think if there's a problem, the nurse should come right away. And they get worried when you hit the button and the nurse doesn't come right away. And you ask them why they get worried, why do they get mad? They actually don't get mad, they get anxious. And it's interesting because when you drill into that a little bit more, and we did that with focus groups, what you find is that patients get anxious because they think if they hit the button and nobody comes, and it's a minor thing, what happens if they hit the button when they can't breathe and it's a big thing? They worry that they'll die. So it's an expectation. They think they hit the button, somebody should come right away. However, if you talk to them about it before they come to the hospital and you say, look, if you hit the button and it's an emergency, people are going to come running. But if you hit the button and it's not an emergency, you may have to wait because the nurse is taking care of other patients, some of them who might have an emergency. Patients are actually okay with that. We did a study where we took one group of patients and we said, let's talk about what it means to be a patient before you come into the hospital. And the other group was the control, where we didn't. And what you see is we measure responsiveness. And the green line is the group that got the education. And the responsiveness scores hit the 90th percentile. Because we just talked about the call button. So patients knew what to expect. Because they don't mind waiting as long as they know that if there's an emergency, someone will come right away. So you're matching the experience and the expectation. So we can have these discussions with patients. We can create better partnerships. Finally, on people. So when you ever talk about trying to change a culture, uh, the culture will rebel and fight down any efforts to change it. It's called organizational immunity. And in my organization, this is who we were. It was all about the doctors. And everybody else was kind of minor. And when we said that we really needed to change this, we said we're all going to be in this together. We're all caregivers. And this is very important because my CEO, Dr. Cosgrove, said it doesn't matter if you're in the basement sweeping the floors or if you're in their operating room operating on a heart. Everybody has a role to support the mission of the organization, which is to take care of patients. We created a service excellence program because we wanted everybody in the organization to know how to treat patients, talk to patients, and we wanted everybody in the organization to know how they should talk to each other. Because how we work together is just as important as how we talk to patients. And then we did this. This is a learning map, and what it is is it's a visual representation of content. We were so bad one of the worst hospitals in the country that we needed to shock the organization. And if you were to go through this exercise, you would do four things. Number one, you would have conversations about what it means to put the patient at the center of everything we do. Number two, we would share stories as to why we're all in this together, why this is about teamwork, why we are all caregivers. 
You would go through our heart service excellence program, so we would actually practice on each other using the tactics that we developed, and you would talk about our values. This is what it looks like in action. It took us a year to put 43,000 people through this. That's my CEO. <coughs> At the end of the program, we had the highest rise in patient experience scores, the highest rise in safety, quality, the fastest decline in complaints, and the highest rise in employee satisfaction. And we did this because we needed to align the organization. We wanted everybody to understand that we are here for patients. And what we did was we randomly assigned people to sit next to each other. So you couldn't sit next to your friends. You could be a neurosurgeon sitting next to a janitor, sitting next to somebody who drives the van. For half a day, you were just a Cleveland Clinic caregiver talking about how to take care of patients. Finally, the physicians. Uh, we were chatting about the physicians being a very difficult group to change. And what we tell the doctors is we're moving accountability from buildings and organizations to individuals. Physicians today in the United States are held personally accountable for a variety of things that they weren't held accountable for before. So we make it very clear that they are just as important and part of this process as the organization is. Transparency in the United States is dramatically increasing. So Consumer Reports is a magazine that publishes data. In Massachusetts, one of our states, they did a survey of doctors and they published the practices. And just like washing machines, they compared the doctors with little circles. So there's enormous transparency. This is a government website where you can go online and eventually you'll be able to see how well doctors communicate with patients. So you can type in my name and see my scores. In the past, it was very secret. Today, we're moving towards complete transparency of data. And physician exposure in the United States is in a variety of areas. Number one, public reporting of outcomes. Number two, complaints. One complaint about a doctor in the United States can lead to a complete review of the hospital's policies. Behavior is carefully monitored by doctor, about doctors and how well we communicate. So the environment in the United States for physicians is very different than it used to be. Physicians are held increasingly accountable individually for their actions. We've focused in very strongly on how well doctors communicate because we think they don't communicate very well. But doctors think they're excellent at it, and just ask them. But when you look at the data, this is one quarter's worth of data of complaints, of comments about doctors. 50% were negative, one quarter. So patients will never tell doctors that they're bad doctors. However, when they are at home, safe, filling out surveys, they will. 50% of the time. And when you look at those complaints, 72%, three quarters, are about how well doctors communicate or don't communicate. So this is a common problem in my country, and I would submit that it's common everywhere, is that doctors think they're excellent at communicating. Generally, they are not, and the data supports that. So we made it our goal to improve how well our doctors develop relationships and communicate with patients. And it's interesting, there was a study that was published in the journal of the American Medical Association that said only 75% of doctors ask for the chief complaint. So this means you walk into the doctor's office and they ask you what's wrong. Only three quarters, one in four of the doctors do that. Only 37% of that 75% we're allowed to complete it. And on average, the doctor interrupts the patient after 23 seconds. So what's wrong? Oh, I know what's wrong. <laughs> so this is a major study that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And patients would have only needed six more seconds to finish the chief complaint if they would have just listened. 
And it's interesting because if physicians didn't allow the patient to answer the chief complaint, they were more likely to get a last minute question as they walked out the door. So doctors are kind of screwing themselves, right? Because they don't take the time to listen to the patient. And because they don't take the time, patients are asking them more questions. So this is about teaching physicians how to better organize their encounter. We spend a lot of money and a lot of time teaching doctors how to be better doctors. We spend a lot of time and a lot of money teaching nurses how to be better nurses. Every year, we're required to do it. No one talks to doctors about how to interact with patients. This is a skill. It can be taught. It can be improved. We put together uh, a team and we looked at all the research because we wanted to make sure that we knew what we were talking about. And when you look at the data, improving communication improves patient satisfaction. It decreases patient stress. It improves compliance with treatment. It improves outcomes. And the body of literature on this is continuing to emerge. It reduces medical errors in malpractice. And it improves physician satisfaction. So this is a very important area for physicians. We put together a team of physicians to lead it. We educated them. We are completely transparent about data. So every piece of individual physician data that we have, we give to our doctors. We put together a task force to help our doctors improve. We created 25 peer coaches where physicians could coach physicians on how to be better communicators. We developed a communication guide and we do the same thing for our house staff, our doctors in training. This is an example of the uh, score sheet. Every physician gets every quarter. It gives their communication skill scores across the board. I took off the names of the guilty. And we also pass out verbatims. So this is one doctor with eight different comments from eight different patients over 90 days. The doctor said to me, verbatims doesn't equal data. And I said, yeah, but I know what the problem is. You're not communicating very well. So using patient stories, using verbatim is very important because it is a window to problems and we should use this more. Finally, we're trying to coalesce thought leadership. We created an association uh, to share information. It's free, please join. <coughs> and every year we do a patient experience summit, which actually has grown to be the largest patient experience summit in the world. So thank you very much. And finally, I'll tell you that patient experience, it's the right thing to do. It's how we would want to be treated. It touches safety and quality as well as satisfaction. It is about the delivery of care. It defines us as an industry. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. I could imagine that there will be some questions to be asked for now already. If not, maybe, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Thank you for your lecture. It was very inspiring, but I have always a but, you know. It, it was very much about patience. And later on, I was sitting in my chair and thought, where are the patients in all of this? I heard a lot about managing experience, about managing, about teaching doctors. My question is, here at Radboud, we try to do it together, patients and doctors. In all your measures, did you include patients to think about it, to do things, and how do you um, close the gap between managing and doing with patients? I would like you to give me some more details, if you can. That, that's a great question, and I will tell you that uh, patients are wrapped around everything that we do. Uh, it is essential to take consideration of patients. We, for, we are organized by departments. Every department has a patient advisory council, which directly feeds back to leadership. 
So I'm part of the Digestive Disease Institute. The chairman of the Digestive Disease Institute sits in with the patients on the council. Uh, we do extensive survey research. So we sample, uh, we send surveys to 50% of the patients uh, two weeks after they're discharged. And we collect that back. Uh, we take that data and we push it out to our managers on a dashboard so they can see their scores. So I can take patient experience feedback from an organization level to a hospital level to a department level to a floor level to a manager level to an individual level. So I can tell every physician exactly what their patients are saying and I hold those physicians accountable for their actions. We do um, a leadership rounding once a month where 130 leaders like this come together and break up into teams of three and four and they go round in the hospital. They talk to patients, they talk to caregivers, and they bring that information back to the auditorium and we debrief on what our patients said. Um, we have a lot of other tactics that we use. I could talk about it all day, but, but the goal is to take as much individual patient feedback and integrate it into the decision making of the organization, always. But not only feedback, but also um, how do you include patients to choose about um, with their doctor what the best treatment is? So sh you're talking about shared decision making. Mm -hmm. And we are currently, that communication program that I talked to you about, we're putting every physician through training this year. So we've trained right now 2,000 doctors on how to have better relationships and better communication with, with patients. And part of that communication training is how to develop shared decision-making tactics. It's very important. And you train the patients as well? We are doing more to educate patients, to engage patients, to be better partners. Thank you very much for your inspiring lecture. I'm uh, from the Reinier de Graaf Teaching Hospital in Delft, and I uh, wonder how much, how, what was the budget that you had to train all the people? How much time that did it cost everybody? Because I think it, you, what you said was very much to my heart, but I think of all the cuts that we have to make, how you get this done. So um, can you give us a bit more information about this and also how you, um, what the system is of following up? So once you train people, how do you keep the new things going? Right. So the program where we took everybody offline for half a day, it took a year to do 43,000 people. And uh, we, it was very, it didn't cost a lot to make the program because we used our people. So each one of those tables had an employee facilitator. So it was all done in-house. The cost of taking people offline in terms of salary. So you're, you're not doing your job for half a day. You're gonna sit at the table is $9 million. But we, we didn't think, we kind of thought the cost going into it, but we thought the, the cost of not doing it was more expensive than the cost of doing it because we could not be in our, where we were with our metrics. We felt passionately that we needed to do something to shock the system, essentially. Uh, to sustain what we've done, we take uh, all of the messaging that was part of the program, patients first, we are all caregivers, our service excellence strategy, and we constantly reinforce that across the organization through messaging, through uh, behavior evaluations. So every employee is evaluated on their patient experience metrics. The other thing that we do is every four months, we take our managers offline for a day. There's 2,500 of them. It takes a week to do everybody. And we talk to them again about what we did, why we did it, what our themes are, patients first, we're all caregivers. And we give them specific tools to help continue to reinforce that. So. It sounds a bit like it's an unlimited budget. 
with a huge office that you got there. Could you elaborate a bit more about the office that you're running from a patient experience perspective? My, my office, I have, um, I have 600 people, however. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. However, <laughs> uh, I also control access. So a big chunk of what I do is patient access, getting patients in. So there's, there's a bunch of people that work on call center, contact center support. The actual people that do this are about 24. <laughs> Other questions up until now? I was just curious whether you involved students and how. Children? Uh, no, medical students. Oh, medical how students. You... Um, we, we do. So we, um, we have classes on patient experience for our medical students. Um, the communication training that all of our physicians go through, our students go through. And um, any new employee that comes into the organization, which would include students, goes through the orientation, the, the half-day patient experience exercise. I think that um, it, it's important to include students and also um, doctors in training because, number one, if you don't, you miss a huge opportunity. They are critical uh, to the interactions with patients. But the other, the other critical feature is that we are training the doctors of the future, and we want to make sure that we're starting them off the right way. What could... Yeah, I have one question about uh, the feedback you're asking your patients from. How do you collect the feedback when they're still in the hospital? Because when I, when I went to the hospital, I had a, a lot of things that so, things that uh, could they do could could do to do better. But when I was home about two weeks, I was thinking, oh yeah, that was a little thing. That was a little thing. But I lost all the things at the moment. So how do you collect the data when they're still in the hospital? Yeah, that's a great question. We're actually, uh, our government forbids us from doing surveys while the patient is in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So we have to do it when they're discharged. And the reason that's the case is because uh, patients are afraid to be honest when they're in the hospital, a lot of patients. So the government uh, wants to make sure that the surveys are done when the patient's at home. However, uh, we have taught all of our, uh, our, our nurse managers, our floor managers, our unit managers, and leaders to round on the patients. So every day, the nurse, the, the nurse who is in charge of a floor will go visit a patient and, and ask them, what can we be doing better for you? What can we change for you? But the surveys, the data is collected after they're discharged. What would be your own top three of things that you've changed because of the patient experience officers in position that would never have been changed if there wasn't such an office? I think number one, my responsibility is to make sure that uh, uh, the organization stays focused on the patient. I think that uh, in our history, we lost track of that. So number one is to keep the focus on the patient. Number two, I think that the most important thing in the organization are our people. It's always about the patient first, but secondly, it's are we always asking the question, what are we doing that's going to impact our employees? Because if we ignore our people, if our people just come to work every day for a job and not come to work every day embracing this idea that they're there to help people, we're not going to be successful. So that's the second thing. And the third thing that keeps me up at night is sustaining what we've done. We've made tremendous progress. And every day I keep thinking, what else can we do better? How can I continue to do what we're doing? How can we sustain it? Where can we learn new things? And I'll just tell you, so it's patients first, it's employees second, and how do we continue it? And I'll tell you that I have a rule that wherever I go, Wherever I travel to, whatever hospital I visit, I have to take something back with me, stealing ideas. <laughs> and I can tell you that uh, 
I'm taking back the idea of the chief listening officer because I think that's a great idea. <laughs> so I'm going to tell everybody about that. And could you share a few of the actual things that have been changed in your hospital that patients can experience on a day-to-day -day basis that uh, people changed over the course of the last, let's say, 12 months? So the last 12 months, um, they'll interact with physicians who communicate better. The last 12 months, they'll have, we're starting to implement room service for food. So you can actually order your food and they'll prepare it on demand. Um, the last 12 months, uh, our service excellence strategy, so how our caregivers talk to patients has improved. I think those, in the last 12 months, I think those are the big things. Hello, thank you. My name is Willem, I'm from the ICU. My question is, how consistent is the Cleveland organization uh, about her policy and vision towards her employees? For example, you work here the Cleveland way or you don't work here at all? <laughs> uh, that's, reti retire. Uh, that's pretty much how it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, we have a zero tolerance policy. And what that means is that, um, you know, we're all about the patient. And if you don't want to be about the patient, then you should go work somewhere else. So we, we very much feel that um, we don't tolerate people who don't do what's right. And so an example, um, um, last year we fired a doctor because he got into an altercation with a nurse. And um, he was a very high-performing surgeon, well-published, very famous but you've got to have zero tolerance. This is about doing what's right for people, for patients. Does that answer your question? <laughs> would, you, would you advise that to your listeners? Here? Yeah, sure. anywhere. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I, you know what? I, I, I speak at Harvard occasionally because my friend invites me to teach at his class and I, I speak to executives who are getting their MBAs, their business degrees. And I say, I give them two examples. Would you rather have the greatest heart surgeon in the world operate on you, but he's a jerk, but he has the best outcomes? Or would you rather have the heart surgeon whose outcomes are okay, their standard of care, but he's a really caring person? Half the class says the great heart surgeon. Half the class says the great person. And I asked them, why should you choose when you can have both? <laughs> right? So in my organization, I don't want just the great surgeon. I want the great person because I know that I can find the great person that's also a great heart surgeon. You can go operate somewhere else. You've got to have both. Uh, I was wondering if you see the results of the um, consumer or the patient satisfaction also translated in the employee satisfaction. In the what? The employee in satisfaction? The, yes. Yes, we do. In fact, uh, we've had the highest rise in our in, uh, employee engagement scores the last four years. So absolutely. And, and it's interesting you ask that because there are some people who believe that engagement goes up when you focus on the patient. And some people believe that patient experience goes up when you focus on the employee. But the point is, they generally move together. Hi, my name is Anna. I work in the Care Academy. And I have a very practical question. How do you match lean with compassionate care and with partnership? Um, how do I teach nurses to be? Um, how to match the rush of the daily work with taking the time to listen and to to do the right thing for the patient and be compassionate. It, you know, it's we, 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 uh, we it's hard, and um, there's a lot of things that we do today that take nurses away from the bedside. For instance, electronic medical record. I know that you just implemented Epic, because on one hand you need to have it, right? The the electronic medical record is essential for safe, high quality care. And the other thing, it it, it erodes that relationship that nurses and, and patients have. I think when we implement systems, whether you're leaning something down or applying Six Sigma, whatever your quality improvement strategy is, you have to think about how does it impact the patient. 
So in the United States today, we're going through major cost cutting because of reductions in healthcare funding. My organization is cutting 20% of costs and every hospital in the United States that wants to survive is going to take 20% of the costs out of their organization over the next five years. And we recently talked about making sure that all of the cuts that we make, we first consider the impact on the patient. So I think that we lose sight of that. We tend to insert business principles into healthcare and we forget about exactly what we're doing. You can do both, but you just have to always remember how it's going to impact the patient. And there are going to be trade-offs. And you know, we have not implemented things that we could have leaned down because it would have a negative impact on patients. You have to make those trade-offs. Does that answer your question? You've, you guys have done an amazing job here. I met with your CEO earlier this morning, and he was telling me about some of the initiatives as well as Lucian was. And you guys, it's an amazing transformation you have here. But you have the same problem. You, you have to make sure that you make compassionate choices. How, is the, how do you export such a model to smaller um, care clinics? What, what will be the priority if you don't have a 24-man team to do so? You know, a lot of what we do, I'm actually, we're, we're a big organization. So 24 for hospitals that are spread out across the world is not, that, not a lot. But a lot of what we do is easy and cheap and common sense. And when you look at the way we break it up, having better conversations with patients is easy. Um, getting nurses to round on patients, is, it's an accountability issue. I think that you don't have to spend a lot of money to improve a lot of these things. You don't need consultants. You don't need special processes. You need common sense and accountability. Holding people accountable, basic management functions. I think in healthcare we don't do that very well, um, but we're learning. We're learning business processes to help us. Thank you very much for your story. I was quite touched by it. Um, for me, uh, as a, a, a patient, uh, it's very moving to hear such uh, stories. Um, I've got a question. I'm quite uh, impatient, as uh, Lucienne is. And here in uh, Radboud, uh, things are going uh, quite well. The uh, patient as partner... Uh, um, uh, but it's that, that idea is not in all hospitals in uh, in the Netherlands. And how can I um, uh, be a part of a revolution as a patient? So how uh, can patients be um, yeah active in the in in getting a revolution? I think you. That's a great question, and it's the same problem we have. I think you have to demand it. I think people need to demand it. And that's easier said than done. And I realize that that's not a clear answer, but um, I think it's going to take role models. I think your hospital is a role model because you're focusing on it. Um, I think it's going to take patients demanding higher standards. And frankly, you know, we were at this in the United States because my CEO demanded it. It's got to come from the top. And in the United States now, it's helped because the government has said it's important. But before the government... Uh, our Medicare, which is our government system, came forward and said, you're going to pay attention to this. Nobody paid attention to it. So it's got to come from the top, but it's also got to come from patients. But how to demand um, this policy on my, on my, um, also from the soft way, so you, you keep in touch with each other, not by demanding in, in, in the pressure or uh, uh, just Right. Patients I, can demand too much, right. and then you get kind of aggression from um, surgeons or uh, doctors. <laughs> and how how can you demand on a way that's also in 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 communication still? I think so. It's a great question, and I think social media is a great way to pick that up. More conversation within the media in the United States. The media has picked up on this. That Consumer Reports. Study is one example, uh, but I think that until hospitals are held accountable, it's going to be hard to rein in physicians, like you said, because there needs to be there needs to be a little bit of a carrot to pull people along to get people energized about it. 
But at some level, there's got to be accountability. Somebody has to tell people, you will be accountable for this. I'm wondering, um, how can you give me some examples? You are um, gathering patient experience. Your nurses during the stay of the patient in the hospital are getting experiences. But after uh, patients go home, you ask patients themselves, not during, that's what I understood from you, not during their stay in the hospital. Um, is there a gap between what your nurses pick up about experiences during the stay and what patients give you back when they are home. What I'm trying to um, say is, when a patient is in hospital, um, there is a dependent, dependency during their stay. They are not the uh, patient who take care of their own process in a way sometimes. Right. What do you do to close that gap? How can we... Um, um, try to verkleinen, uh, 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 smallen the gap. Yes. I, I, I think, so I, I don't think there's a gap, actually. Okay. I, I think that we, I think we're pretty good at figuring out what, what patients are saying because we're constantly asking and we plotted out the journey. So we've plotted out patient journeys from the time they hit the door all the way through and we look at critical points where we think we need to collect information and we've done that for a very a variety of service lines so I, I think you can always get more but I think we're getting a lot so I'll say it like that I think the most important data is when the patient is at home it's important that we know that, that we're constantly asking patients in the hospital so that we can do service correction when we need to if something's not happening that should be happening. But patients in the hospital are not honest. They're afraid. So I think the most important data is what you get at home. Because at home, they're not afraid anymore. And they're more honest. I'm, I'm, I'm puzzled now. <laughs> because in my opinion, we have a lot of patients coming, coming here, go home, come back. And in my view, it is very important that a patient during staying in the hospital um, try to diminish the, uh, the, the, the anxiety. And you have to help them yes. with that. No, I, I agree. I like to have a very uh, supporting patient in the bed as much as possible because it helps to recover. It helps to get home earlier. Yeah, no, I, that's important, and I agree with you. And so we make sure we're always asking patients while they're in the hospital. But what I'm saying is the feedback on their experience is better when they're at home. I'm not convinced. I'm so sorry. sorry. That's okay. I disagree on this point. <laughs> that's work in progress. Yes. <laughs> now, it's, is, is, is there a difference between, let's say, a regular hospital and, for instance, a children's hospital? in terms of this process that you're running? Um, the children's hospital is different because you have two patients, right? You have the ch child and you have the family. And um, so you have to make sure you're capturing both. So I think that's a unique problem. Somebody raise their hand for a question. Hi, my name is Inge van der Broek from the Patients Association for Cardiovascular Diseases. And you talked about the, uh, the zero tolerance policy. Um, and I'm curious to hear, um, uh, especially for the doctors, what's in for the doctors? Because zero tolerance is the last step, I guess. <laughs> um, have you any idea what's, uh, what's motivating, especially the doctors in this process? Well, we've made it part of their evaluation. So their, communi their communication scores are part of their annual performance. Uh, we monitor complaints. If they get more than so many complaints, we talk to them. If it happens over and over again, they have a problem. We hold, 
we hold them accountable for their outcomes, their behavior, how well they communicate, and um, uh, their complaints. I mean, is there? Uh, do you notice any uh, more intrinsical motivation? Oh yes. Uh, what <laughs> you know to to work different for what's what's motivating the doctors to to follow the, the um, this. New methods. Well, so I, I, when I talk to physicians, I like to get them to do it for the, because it's the right thing to do. Um, I tell them, you know, do it because it's the right thing to do, number one, or do it because it's the way you would want to be treated, number two, or number three, uh, do it because uh, it's the way you'd want your family to be treated, or, or number four, uh, do it because our government now says you have to. Or ultimately, number five, I tell them, if you don't want to do it for one of the three right reasons, then do it because your job's going to depend on it. <laughs> <laughs> and then that's how it is. I mean, my, uh, I'll tell you a funny story. So one of the, you know, all of our doctors went through our training, half-day training, and uh, one of the doctors wrote Dr. Cosgrove an email and said, I'm sorry, I have a lot of patients to see. I'd have to cancel clinic, so I can't attend. And so canceling clinic is a big deal. You know, nobody wants to cancel clinic. Dr. Cosgrove writes this doctor back and says, well, uh, if you can't attend, I'm sorry, but maybe you should take your clinic to another hospital. So the point is you have to, you have, to have zero tolerance. It's about accountability. Most people in healthcare, in my hospital, 95%, are there for the right reasons and absolutely come to work every day because they understand it's about patients. I think 2.5% of those people are there for the right reasons, but they need a little help understanding and remembering why. And 2.5% need to go. <laughs> and, and your job as managers in HR, as leaders, is to figure out which ones need to go. Because it's not that they're bad people, but they shouldn't be taking care of people. And so if doctors don't want to pay attention to how well they communicate and how well they treat patients and whether or not they're being nice to their colleagues, we don't want them. Uh, you said that uh, patients were um, uh, very much involved in decision making concerning patient care. Um, I have. Uh, I wonder how you organize that in your hospital. For instance, here at the Radboud, we got a patient's advisory board, mm -hmm. but I, I'm Yopi is a chair of that, and I'm not sure whether they are always um, consulted uh, in these big decisions. And um, the second thing is what I wanted to ask is that you, you mentioned something about a patient summit every year. Uh, how valuable is that to your organization, and uh, what do you do in a day like that when you get these patients? So uh, I'll give you some examples of things that recently our patient councils have used to, to help us. And, we, and as I said, we have a council for all of our institutes. So we recently redesigned our admission guide for our patients based on patient feedback. In fact, every page of it was vetted by the patients. We have redesigned our waiting rooms because of patients. Um, one of our floors, uh, actually it was in my area, uh, had bad cleanliness scores. Patients kept saying it was dirty. And um, we couldn't figure out why, because we'd round with the janitors. The floors were clean, the rooms were clean. So we, we took the, 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 the issue to the patient panel for that institute, and they said it's the bathrooms. They said this is, these are uh, GI patients, gastrointestinal patients. And they said, uh, you know, the bathrooms are very important to us and, and they're dark and they're cluttered because there's urinals and the, it's not organized. So we, we reorganized all the bathrooms. We put new lights in and the scores went up. And so I think that we, we miss things because we don't listen to patients. And when we're, when we're stumbling on something, we always go back to the patients and ask them to help us with things like that. So it's big things like admission guides and waiting rooms and it's little things like cleanliness scores. Last question before the drinks. Um, you seem to have a great relationship with your CEO, Dr. Kosgrove. What's the one thing that he doesn't let you do 
that you most wanted to do in favor of patients at present? That's a bit kind of a rabble question, I know. Well, I have a great relationship with him because I work for him, so. <laughs> you know, um, you know, when I, when I, uh, there's nothing. When I took this job, when it, I interviewed with him, and uh, the story is I, I didn't want this job. My chairman put my resume in, and um, I got an interview with Dr. Kazagrove. And Dr. Cosgrove says, why, why do you want this job? I said, I don't want this job. <laughs> and he goes, and I, and I told him a personal story about my family. And uh, then he goes, well, how do you think we should fix this? And I go, I don't know. And I said, I'm kind of a smart aleck. And I said, how do you think we should fix it? And he said, I don't know. And uh, I said, well, I guess if you give me the job, you'll, we'll have to figure it out together. And I thought for sure I'd never get the job, which I was hoping, but I did. And uh, you know, he has never, never, never said no. And we've tried some things that have worked and failed badly. And we've wasted a lot of money. And we've tried some things that have worked really successfully. Uh, but he has always supported anything that is important for patients. So, well, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for now. Um, I would invite all of you to the drinks that are just in the lobby. On your way out, there are two books just at the front entrance desk. Please pick them with you. Thank you for now. A warm round of applause for Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.